Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Dorothy Meal. I'm the Head of College of Humanities and Social Science, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome so many people. I don't think I've been to such a well-attended inaugural, so I'm really looking forward to, to this event this evening. It's a beautiful day uh, in Edinburgh, and it's lovely to see so many people having come out on that beautiful day to sit uh, and join Ewan with his inaugural lecture. Um, we're filming the event today, and this will then be available on YouTube for all the many hundreds of thousands of people who couldn't get here today to see. Uh, and uh, we were just saying how we're expecting him and the Sc uh, Scottish history to be trending on Twitter any time now. Um, this evening's lecture will be followed by a period of questions and questioning and answering for just a few minutes, really, because we want to then move on into the reception, which is going to be just outside in the foyer there. And uh, I know that Ewan would be very happy if as many people as possible who are here for the talk can stay on and, and uh, have a bit more informal conversation and uh, <coughs> celebration. Um, I th I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Ewan to, to do this inaugural. Uh, he was appointed to the Sir William Fraser Professor of Scottish History and Paleography Chair here at the university last year, but having earlier been promoted to a personal chair in history, in 2011. But he's been at the university a long time, first came here in 1993 as a lecturer, having studied before that at St Andrews and Glasgow University. And he's been an incredibly active member of the university as a whole, and particularly of the School of History, Classics and Archaeology as it became when it was formed. Um, not only being a popular and effective leader of Scottish history, but then subsequently uh, after the three areas of history were merged, uh, and a very effective head of history in recent years. His research focuses on the history of Scotland since 1800, and especially the history of the Scottish Highlands, Scottish political history, and Scottish-Irish comparative history. One of his most well-known scholarly works is the monograph Impaled on a Thistle, Scotland since 1880, which was published in 2010, and he's co-editor of the Scottish Historical <coughs> Review. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Ewan to the, to the lectern and also to, I should have said earlier, welcome his family here, who I'm sure are going to be particularly uh, interested to hear what he's got to say this evening. But Ewan, please come to the lectern. You might not be clapping at the end. Um, well, thank you, uh, Professor Meal, for that uh, extremely uh, generous um, introduction and um, for all your help and support to history, classics, and archaeology um, in your time in the, in the university. Um, on an occasion like this, there aren't necessarily many uh, thanks uh, to offer before, we, uh, before I begin. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to thank my family um, particularly my parents um, for their encouragement in my education um, over the years. Uh, my late father's sort of pithy review of my first book, uh, it's a bit heavy going, uh, was, was probably quite, quite accurate in retrospect. Um, but I'd also like my thank my family for offering uh, perspective. Uh, Sally, Thomas and Olivia uh, helped me to understand that the latest article in the Scottish Historical Review is not necessarily the most important uh, thing um, in life. Um, I've also been extremely uh, fortunate um, in people who've supported me through my uh, extended educational career, financially and otherwise. I was very fortunate to have great teachers, uh, particularly of history and English, at uh, Milburn Academy in Inverness. And uh, you may have to grant me some license for a few Invernesian references uh, this afternoon. Uh, particularly my English teacher who in retrospect, I encouraged interest in, in things Scottish uh, by setting a series of, of Scottish texts for our higher English studies, particularly Neil Gunn's novel, The Silver Darlings, which was really the text which, which brought me into uh, Scottish history um, eventually. And indeed, political history through, through fiction is a very interesting uh, potential uh, area of, of thought for, for historians uh, through the works of Eric Linklater, Neil Gunn himself, and 
Uh, James Robertson's recent brilliant novel, The Land Lay Still, I'm sure in such a well-read audience as this, there are a few who, who wouldn't have read that novel, but um, if you haven't, I certainly um, encourage you to do so. Um, at the University of Aberdeen and Glasgow, um, I had great support from people like Jennifer Carter, Dawn Witherington, um, and at Glasgow, particularly my supervisor, Alan McInnes, and other uh, robust uh, individuals uh, such as Archie Duncan, uh, Roy Campbell, Roy Campbell, and on a more gentle note, uh, the late John McCaffrey, uh, who provided some, some mitigation. Um, it was also a very sociable uh, community in nine university gardens. Sometimes I wonder how we all survived, and I see one or two survivors of that, of that time in the, in the audience today. Um, it's appropriate, I've not been in this lecture hall before uh, yesterday afternoon, but it's very appropriate because uh, just across the road, number 17, Buclue Place, uh, before, the, before the better together days of, of history. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't aware I made a joke there. But, um, <laughs> uh, before these days, um, 17 McClue Place was the, the home of Scottish history. Um, and my colleagues there, um, particularly Michael Lynch, uh, late John Simpson, John Bannerman, Geoffrey Barrow, Bill Ferguson, uh, whom we saw last night, um, were, were very encouraging and supportive to, to a young and pretty, pretty, green, uh, pretty green lecturer. Also, I suppose, I think uh, we ought to thank Sir William Fraser, uh, who, after all, uh, in his will, uh, left uh, some money to the universities to support his life's work. Um, unfortunately, he, he was not very explicit about what his life's work uh, was. And he uh, indicated um, that it should be used to support ancient history. Um, but after taking legal advice, <laughs> and I know there are some lawyers in the room, uh, after taking some legal advice, um, the university decided uh, that he really meant Scottish history. <laughs> and um, although they, uh, they gave a little money uh, for a lectureship in classics, but most of it went, uh, to endow the, the chair of, of Scottish history and paleography. And that sort of financial distribution model is not one, of course, that we use in, in history, classics, and archaeology anymore, but uh, that was what was done in those days. And if you wanted to know a little bit more about Sir William Fraser, I encourage you to look at the, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry by, by one of my predecessors, Geoffrey Barrow, also educated in Inverness. Um, Geoffrey has a a biting uh, biography, I think, of, of Fraser. Um, he describes him as an inveterate snob. Um, he dearly loved a lord and liked nothing better than hobnobbing uh, with the landed classes. And Fraser made most of his money um, by uh, writing family histories of the, of the Scottish aristocracy. I'm not quite sure what he would have made of a crofter's son um, in, his, in his chair. Um, so this evening, um, I want seemed appropriate, uh, given the current moment, to uh, talk a bit about, about Scottish political history. Uh, the more perceptive among you uh, may have noted that there's, there's a referendum um, about to happen next year. Uh, worryingly for me, it's on the same day as the Kamenach Cup final, <laughs> so my loyalties will be stretched. Um, but the referendum, I think, um, presents the electors in Scotland with a choice between two apparent absolutes, independence and the status quo. In reality, however, I think the matter is not nearly so simple. Uh, more is known about what might happen if the, uh, the other Better Together campaign achieve their aim, um, but it will not be the status quo ante. Uh, the passage of the Scotland Act 2012 uh, means that the nature of devolution after the referendum will be strikingly different from that which has existed since 98-99, if better together have their way. The Scotland Act, a remarkable piece of legislation which was debated at both Westminster and Holyrood, is based on the deliberations of the Kalman Commission, which sat from 2008-2009. And the most important provision of the Act is to increase the responsibility uh, of the Scottish Parliament to, to raise the money which it spends. Um, currently, uh, that figure stands around 
but it would rise to around 35% um, should, should the Scotland Act be implemented after a no vote in the referendum. Should the outcome of the referendum be a victory for the Yes campaign, um, it will be the signal for the start of negotiations about the precise meaning of independence. The division of the assets and liabilities of the United Kingdom will be a complex process and will involve discussions about oil revenues, uh, the currency of an independent Scotland, the national debt, public sector pensions, defence and foreign affairs, membership of the European Union and other um, international organisations and a host of other matters, large and small. Now these are no doubt complications, for some they may be obstacles, but there's no doubt, given the political culture of the United Kingdom, um, that Scotland can be independent. Not necessarily saying it should be independent, but it can be independent. It's not the intention of this lecture to make predictions um, about the outcome of the referendum, far less the outcome of, of these negotiations which will ensue. The process will undoubtedly be enormously challenging for the Scottish Government, uh, given the differences in resources um, that are available to it and to the, to the RUK, to use an acronym that we know well in the university, to the RUK government, the rest of the UK. Um, historians' record on predictions is not good. Um, one example includes the foolish author of a recent book on modern and contemporary Scotland, um, who averred that the voting system for the Scottish Parliament bequeathed by the Scotland Act of, of 1998 made it, and I quote uh, from his deficient work, make it uh, virtually impossible, he said, for any party to achieve a majority in the Scottish Parliament. Not content with this folly, uh, he went on to suggest that amendment of the Scotland Act to colonise formerly reserved powers is fraught with difficulty. Now this is, of course, exactly what has happened. And equally, the SNP majority secured at the election of 2011 um, is there for all to see. Um, I wouldn't go into a casino or log on to Bet365 with, with that historian. <laughs> Historians should stick to the past. Um, although they do things differently there, it is perhaps safer, safer territory. So the referendum to be held in September next year um, and the Scotland Act of 2012 make this a moment of great interest in Scottish politics. Um, even The Guardian, and have I got news for you, uh, take an interest. Uh, current events have also brought economic, uh, sorry, <laughs> can't read my own writing, so much for paleography, uh, academic, <laughs> academic scrutiny um, as the possibilities and uncertainties of what might happen um, in the aftermath of the referendum generates speculation and argument um, in equal measure. In a wider sense, um, in British history more broadly, uh, political history has undergone a revival in the last decade or so. Go back to the 1980s and there was widespread gloom about this element of historical inquiry. I don't particularly want here to dwell on arcane, incestuous analysis of private conversations among academic historians, but it is worth noting um, that the subject has been brought to life, political history that has been brought to life by the practice of what has become known as the new political history. Unlike the new cultural history, uh, no cats were massacred in the making of this school of inquiry. I see there's some very well-read people in the room. Um, but it has broadened the way we think about politics and elections. Like all self-consciously new approaches, it rests on a slight caricature of what went before, the old political history. Um, but these historians, the new political historians so-called, have enjoined us not to use deterministic interpretations of political change based on social and economic evidence, have encouraged us to extend our frame of reference beyond the private machinations of elite politicians. I quite like the private machinations of elite politicians myself, quite, spent quite a lot of time researching that. Um, but they've also encouraged us to pay attention to the material culture of the political process and to pay attention to the language used by politicians to communicate their ideas to the electorate. Now one doesn't have to buy into everything suggested by these historians to find the approach useful. Um, later in the lecture I want to look outwards uh, to the political dimensions of Scotland's engagement with the empire, 
But this approach to political history also helps us to pay particular attention to local political cultures, the arenas in which politicians addressed the electorates, especially in the Victorian and Edwardian periods, through local newspapers, an especially rich source of material for the political historian, which were such an important means of communication with the voters, and even those who couldn't vote, but who participated in the theater of election contests in this period, and also contributed to political outcomes. The workmen who waited at the edge of the town of Inverness for the arrival of the carriage of Charles Fraser Mackintosh, the apparently radical liberal candidate, so that they could unhitch the horses um, and pull his carriage in a triumphant procession to the venue of his political meeting in the music hall on, on Union Street in the town. Occasionally, this riotousness was resented by those who felt that it introduced an element of vulgarity to the political process. In 1868, uh, the Dunfermline Press, just to choose at random another Scottish town, um, worried about the riotings and turmoils, all the hatred, anger, and envy, all the unseemly scenes of intoxication and vice, imagine that in Dunfermline, <laughs> which generally attend a sharply contested um, election. In an even more hotly contested election in the same town in 1892, the staunchly liberal Dunfermline Journal was deeply worried by the corrosive effect of the polarised debate on Irish home rule and resented the likelihood of innovations such as the political picnic, the fireworks and crackers, punch and judy shows and heaven knows what, which would come in the wake of an establishment of a branch of the Primrose League, a unionist organisation in the town. The paper noted that liberals were attracted to meetings by the prospect of attractive oratory and did not have to be induced to attend by the prospects of fireworks or, or tea and cookies. You might get some tea and cookies after this, after this lecture. So the political culture then of small town Scotland in the Victorian Edwardian period, rich in their potential for understanding the key political history of the period before 1922 when liberalism dominated Scottish politics. From 1832 until the outbreak of the First World War, the Liberals won a majority of Scottish seats at every election, except that of 1900, which was fought in the unusual conditions stimulated by the Boer War. And, in any case, um, it was a defeat, the 1900 election, from which the Liberals recovered very quickly in by-elections before the next uh, general election in 1906, at which they returned to form with a dominant performance. Victories which were repeated in the two general elections of 1910, at which the conservative recovery evident in England uh, was nowhere to be seen in Scotland. Austin Chamberlain, the, one of the conservative leaders, put it down to the, the Scots' obsession with land reform. So the Liberals' dominance of the 19th century uh, Scottish political scene was virtually total, and it extends well beyond the ballot box. The key institutions of Scottish uh, public life in this period were dominated by the Liberals. The Presbyterian churches, especially the Free Kirk and the United Presbyterian Church, and after 1900, the United Free Church. I really love Presbyterian division and all the, the names that, that, that come with it. I see Jay Brown there as well, who likes it even more than me, I think. Um, they were in marked contrast then to the period between the wars um, when the Conservative Party uh, dominated the, the churches. And these churches were solidly liberal in their outlook. The late Victorian period saw them developing progressive ideas about the development of society. The leading Presbyterian clergymen of the day, such as James Begg, Robert Rainey, John Marshall Lang, produced detailed ideas about the major questions of the day, urban poverty, highland land reform, industrialization, and other questions. Even more important than the churches, then, was the role of the press in sustaining the liberal culture of politics in 19th century Scotland. Aside from the liberalism of the great prominent national newspapers in the country, the Scotsman, the Glasgow Herald, the Aberdeen Free Press, even the Inverness Courier, and the Aberdeen Free Press, the latter edited successfully by William McCombe and um, William Alexander, important cultural and literary figures as well as journalists. The press, can which, uh, which can be described more properly as local, was also completely dominated by the, by the liberals. And I think a history of Scottish journalism uh, 
And as we move out into the empire in a, in a moment in the lecture, a history of Scottish journalism, another really fruitful area of research. Journalists were one of Scotland's uh, greatest uh, exports in the, in the 19th century. Uh, the Conservatives recognised this domination of the press as one of their principal weaknesses in Scotland. Um, the papers which did have a Conservative editorial line, the Edinburgh Evening Courant, the Aberdeen Journal, uh, did not circulate so widely as their liberal competitors. Nor, to this reader at least, did they have the editorial and journalistic vitality um, of the liberal press. And efforts made by the Conservative Party in the late 19th century to develop a Scottish Conservative press um, were, were highly significant, including um, activity by uh, landowners and industrialists. William Baird of Gart Sherry, uh, the Iron Master, was a prominent supporter of the, um, of the Conservative Party um, in their uh, attempt to, to develop a, a, a conservative press in Scotland. There's a remarkable journalist called Duncan Campbell, who's left a very rich autobiography, um, who edited a, a, a vituperative newspaper called the, the Northern Chronicle, um, which uh, attacked uh, liberalism and attacked uh, Gladstone um, in, uh, with, you know, with some great, great phrases, great, great journalism. Uh, Campbell had acquired um, editorial uh, experience in the, in the north of England and defining journalistic experience in South Africa and the Cape Colony um, before returning home to, to take on that, um, edit, the editor's chair of the, of the Chronicle. Um, his attacks on Gladstone's imperial misadventures in Egypt, the Sudan, and South Africa uh, knew no bounds and indicated for Campbell, as for other conservatives in Scotland, the vacuous nature of Gladstone's or or oratory at Midlothian in 1879 and 1880. And it was such feeling which created the market uh, for conservative chamber pots um, adorned with an image of Gladstone so that Tories could make uh, regular deposits in, in opposition to, to, the liberal, to the liberal leader. Uh, the effect of the debate on Irish home rule eroded to an extent the liberal domination of the Scottish press, even if it did not immediately threaten their domination of Scottish politics. The Scotsman, under the distinguished editorship of Charles Cooper, came out in opposition to Gladstone's plans for Irish home rule. The Glasgow Herald uh, moved in the same direction, as did many local newspapers. 1886 was an important moment in the history of modern Scottish politics. Uh, not only did it see the establishment of the Scottish Home Rule Association, building on the earlier National Association for the Vindication of Scottish Rights. Um, but it also introduced a new term to the nomenclature of Scottish politics, unionism. The union which was at issue, of course, uh, was that with Ireland, as our colleague Alvin Jackson has elegantly argued in his, in his recent book, The Two Unions. It's union with Ireland rather than the older Anglo-Scottish Union that liberal unionists who voted against Irish Home Rule merged with the Conservative Party in 1912 uh, to form the body which was known from then until 1965 as the Scottish Unionist Party. The word conservative being absent from the Scottish political lexicon in the period of the party's greatest success north of the border. Although the link is not necessarily a, a causal one. 1886 was also significant in that many of the principal issues relating to devolution were raised in the discussion over Irish Home Rule. For anyone immersed in that debate, um, many of the current issues and questions are strikingly familiar. We're correct to recognize the contribution of our former rector, the redoubtable Tam Diel, to the devolution debate by noting his West Lothian question. But the same question was posed in 1886. Further, the details of how to fund a devolved parliament and administration, whether by grant, by assignment of taxation, minus a charge for imperial contribution, um, or thirdly, by devolution of powers of taxation, um, was fully considered by Gladstone and other home rulers of the period. Further, the biggest issue arising from devolution, um, that is, how to accommodate a devolved parliament in a wider British constitutional system based on parliamentary sovereignty, was rehearsed at length during the 1886 debate and its successors in the early 90s and just before the First World War. This was the principal theme in the work of Albert Venn Dicey, not much referred to in the current debate, 
um, and his series, series of polemical works, um, which enunciated deep veneration for the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, and which inveighed against such weaknesses as home rule and federalism. England's case against home rule, 1886, was his initial essay on this theme, but one of his final publications, 1920, um, was on the Anglo-Scottish Union of 1707, and it was co-authored uh, by the holder of the Chair of Scottish History and Literature at the University of Glasgow. Uh, for those who know the current holder of that, of that chair, I think it's unlikely that he will be cooperating with uh, those who venerate uh, parliamentary sovereignty um, in the near future. What I want to do for um, the second half of the lecture is to, to look outwards before returning to look at the political culture of, of 20th century uh, Scotland before uh, concluding with some, uh, with some general remarks. Um, one of the most significant developments in the writing of Scottish history in the last decade or so has been the concerted effort to analyze it in an imperial and global context. Uh, my predecessor, my immediate predecessor, Tom Devine, has brought this to fruition most splendidly um, in his Scotland's Empire and his recent The Global Scot, which have added great depth and sophistication to our understanding, not only of the extent and pattern of Scottish emigration, um, but also to the behavior, mostly social, economic, and military, of Scots in the Dominions in the USA. Um, if you just permit me uh, an aside at the moment, I'm very grateful to, uh, to Tom for his support and encouragement um, over the years. Tom is the it's one of those defining moments in an academic life, but, but Tom was the um, external examiner for my PhD uh, thesis, and uh, he approached this task with his, his customary light, light touch uh, by telling me at the beginning um, that I'd um, passed for the degree, a practice which is outlawed now, I think. Uh, but he then proceeded to lay into the thesis with such vigor that I thought he'd changed his mind. <laughs> I thought he'd changed his mind, and I was, I was getting increasingly nervous. Uh, the other odd aspect of that occasion was the, the sight of my supervisor, Alan McInnes, sitting mute for nearly two hours. It was also a, an event which didn't happen very often. Uh, so I'm very grateful, Tom, for all your, your support. So Tom, in his, in his books, um, has drawn our attention uh, to the global aspect of Scottish history. Um, but earlier Fraser professors have also drawn attention to the need for a global history of Scotland. This was the theme of the inaugural lecture of, or one of the themes of, of Gordon Donaldson's inaugural lecture in 1964. Among the prolific output of that most iconoclastic historian was The Scots Overseas, published in 1966, um, a year in which many Scots might have been tempted to, to move overseas. <laughs> But the political dimensions of the, the global turn, if you like, in Scottish history, however, uh, remain relatively uh, unexplored. Uh, this is especially striking in comparison to studies of the global Irish community, in which their contribution to the politics of Irish nationalism has been such a central feature. There is, of course, a clear difference between Scottish and Irish nationalism, especially in the late uh, 19th century. Excuse me. Although Scottish nationalists, such as they were um, in this period, uh, made efforts to engage with the global community of Scots, especially in the USA, um, they were not very successful. Um, other manifestations of the international activities of Scottish nationalists, such as the bizarre effusions of uh, Ruri Erskine of Mar, for example, uh, but more substantial were the attempts of Highland land reformers such as John Murdoch and Alexander Mackenzie, to take the grievances and demands of the crofters to the USA and Canada in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And I'm very pleased that, that, that Jim Hunter, who's the leading historian of these matters, is, is also in the room. And I'm also very grateful to Jim for, for continuing to talk to me after me being so rude about his, his books over the, over the years, um, books which I've come to admire um, increasingly. Young historians ought not to be as rude as they're inclined to be sometimes. But Murdoch and Mackenzie's task was compromised by their mutual disregard and contrasting attitudes to, to life. And an attempt to establish a Highland Land League of America came to, came to little. 
Imperial issues, however, were, of course, central to Scottish politics in all periods from at least the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the domination of Scottish politics by the Liberals was part of, this, part of this process. The safety of Scottish seats attracted a wide range of leading politicians, carpetbaggers, according to their critics, to Scottish seats. Gladstone, of course, Augustine Burrell, Asquith, uh, J.W. Phillips, the conqueror of Keir Hardy, Goshen, Childers, and most famously Winston Churchill, who sat for Dundee um, from the by-election of 1908 until his defeat by a prohibitionist in 1922. And um, this fact, the carpetbaggers, in addition to the presence of leading Scots, such as Campbell Bannerman, Haldane, and others in the front rank of politics, meant the Scottish politics were conducted under intense scrutiny, and global issues were very much on the agenda. The structure of the Scottish economy, with its heavy industry strongly geared towards product for export, meant that international economic issues were prominent. This was especially so, as we've been recently reminded by Jim Tomlinson um, at the by-election in Dundee in 1908. Uh, Jim Tomlinson, Tomlinson has argued that Dundee, by virtue of the domination of the local economy by the jute industry, uh, that the city was therefore very highly globalized and the local political culture reflected this. Uh, Churchill won the by-election with an aggressive appeal to free trade, despite the protectionist views of some of the leading figures in the jute industry, which dominated the city, and the wider social concerns of his labor opponent about conditions in the Calcutta jute mills, uh, mills which were becoming such significant competitors to, to Dundee. The debate over free trade and protection, both of which, as historians uh, Frank Trentman and Tony Howe have reminded us, generated their own political cultures of publications, pressure groups, political meetings. The protectionists, for example, one of the, um, the, the earliest people to use film um, as, as part of political campaigning in the very early 19th century. Um, these, these debates served to re-energize liberalism in the aftermath of the Boer War. Although Joseph Chamberlain um, initiated his tariff reform campaign which he hoped would draw the empire closer together through schemes of preference. He opened that campaign in Greenock. Um, he was soon trumped by leading liberals. Asquith began the liberal fight back, which helped to reunite the party as the unionists fractured over tariff reform. Free trade and tariff reform is essentially uh, an imperial uh, debate, which had particular relevance to Scotland. The historiography of this question has tended to emphasize the pro-imperial dimensions of Scottish political debate through the contributions of liberal imperialists such as Rosebery, Haldane, Asquith, Monroe Ferguson on the liberal side and unionists such as John Buchan, Andrew Boner Law, whose Canadian background provided him with a, a distinctive point of view on tariff reform. While not wishing to overemphasize the importance of an anti-imperial or empire reform strand in Scottish politics, it's worth noting um, other political traditions in this respect. The presence of Sir William Wedderburn, one of the founders of the Indian National Congress as MP for Banffshire from 1893. He was also the biographer of Alan Octavian Hume, whom he described as the, as the father of the Congress. A much more unambiguously anti-imperial figure was, was G.B. Clark, Gavin Clark, the MP for Caithness, right up in the north of Scotland from 1885 to 1900. He was one of the most radical figures ever I think, to sit for a Scottish constituency in this period. He was initially elected on a land reform ticket, although the crofters of Caithness did not necessarily uh, support his belief in full-scale land nationalization. But his position became highly controversial during the Boer War, when he was amongst the most vocal pro-Boers, a position for which he was excoriated as being deeply unpatriotic and disloyal. Such such were the extremity of his views on South Africa and other imperial questions that he was even regarded as an embarrassment to the cause by Hector McPherson, the editor of the very advanced Edinburgh Evening News, local newspaper here in Edinburgh. Uh, Clark's position became even more difficult when British forces captured Bloemfontein in late 1900 and his correspondence with Paul Kruger and other leading Boers uh, was among the documents they discovered. His advocacy of the cause of the Boer Republics pushed him further to the boundaries of political acceptability, and he became the principal imperialist 
target at the general election of 1900 when his opponent uh, was Lester Harmsworth, brother of Lord Northcliffe, um, who threw all the considerable resources of his new tabloid newspaper, uh, the Daily Mail, um, were thrown at, at Clark. Caithness became the most polarized battleground in the debate about the empire conducted at this general election. Harmsworth, who charged around the narrow roads of Caithness um, in a powerful car, was, was triumphant. He was just able to get to more meetings and, and uh, get to more voters than was, than was Clark. But Clark remained a notable figure in radical and labor circles in Scotland and much further afield until his death in, in 1930. What can we say then about the political activities of, of Scots abroad? This theme is quite difficult to excavate from the existing historiography, but some tentative suggestions can be, can be made. It's easy to construct a list, of course, of the imperial, of the leading imperial politicians in the empire who had Scots background. John A. Macdonald in Canada, uh, Peter Fraser in New Zealand, Lachlan Macquarie in Australia. But it is interesting, I think, to try to move beyond this, this elite. Um, historians of left-wing politics, I think, have made the biggest effort in this area. Left-wing ideas, they suggest both implicitly and explicitly, are more easily transferable to different contexts. Sometimes this work descends into uncritical celebration of the export of a virtuous Scottish radical tradition. In more challenging works, however, it stimulates important questions about attitudes to society, race, industry, and empire. The context in which this has been most fully developed is in um, excellent work about South Africa, particularly by a, a sociologist, Jonathan Hislop, whose work I've really enjoyed reading and preparing for this lecture. In an excellent book about the Scottish trade unionist, James Thompson Bain, and a series of superb articles about the contexts in which Bain operated, uh, Professor Hislop has highlighted the extent to which Bain and his colleagues were, despite their radicalism, complicit in the defense of white labor rights, which were based on racist attitudes to black workers. Uh, Bain was a troublesome individual. He was a member in this city of the Scottish Land and Labor League, which was the, the Scottish name for William Morris's uh, Socialist League um, here in Edinburgh. Um, he was a soldier in the British Army, and he fought in Africa in the late 1870s. But during the Boer War, he fought against British forces um, and was imprisoned and, and almost uh, executed. Um, he later led a series of strikes um, in South Africa in 1913 um, for his part in which he was imprisoned and deported along with the other leading trade unionists. The deportees were fated by the British labor movement a series of vast meetings across England and Scotland in 1914. Now, Hislop's interpretation of the views of Bain and his colleagues has been criticized by um, our friend Billy Kennefick of the University of Dundee, who's argued that their views were broader and more racially inclusive um, than suggested by, by Hislop. And without taking firm sides in this debate, although I think that the weight of Hislop's evidence is compelling, this um, uh, debate does open up a series of very interesting questions about Scottish political culture in an imperial context that are ripe for further investigation. Um, in British Columbia, if we look at another context for a moment, issues of race and economic control were also present in the network of Scots who were active in the fishing industry, in both the business side of that industry and in the trade unions. Uh, periodically, the provincial government of British Columbia attempted to organize assisted emigration schemes from Scotland in order to develop the industry. These plans had political objectives, as Mike Vance has reminded us in his important work in this topic. He points out that emigration schemes were an attempt to undermine labor militancy, as they hoped to replace militants uh, with compliant workers. Scots were also involved, on the other side, in communist activities to organize the fishermen and also to end segregation along ethnic and gender um, lines. Vance presents a different view to that of his law and emphasizes the role of Scots trade unionists in attempts to overcome racial prejudice and discrimination to both the native peoples and the Japanese, who had been such an important element in the West Coast fisheries, West Coast of Canada fisheries since the late 19th century. I'm sorry, Steve, that's Steve Boardman's here. That's the closest I can get to herring uh, in, the, in the lecture. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, Scots also exported their politics associated with the land question. Um, given the shortage of land in Scotland and the power of the landowning class in Scottish rural and urban society, the vast open spaces of the empire seemed particularly attractive to Scottish emigrants. This was not a straightforward process of escape from the clutches of rapacious landlords. The political implications of this process are particularly evident um, in, in New Zealand, um, where the Minister for Lands in the Liberal governments of the late 19th century, John Mackenzie, presented himself as a victim of the Highland Clearances and directed his land reform activities accordingly. It's been thoroughly worked over by the New Zealand historian Tom Brooking in his book, Lands for the People. It's almost a very good title for a book. <laughs> uh, Mackenzie drew on his experience of the tenurial insecurity of Scottish crofters before the Crofters Act, and he sought to create forms of tenure based on very long, virtually perpetual leases in New Zealand. So I won't talk too much about the, the arcane elements of land reform about which I'm so fond. I'll get to the point in a moment. Uh, Mackenzie was successful in breaking up large concentrations of land ownership in New Zealand. Although much of the land for the resettlement came from privately owned <coughs> estates and from crown land, but substantial amounts also came from the 11 million acres still under Maori ownership in the 1890s when Mackenzie was at his most active. The Liberal governments of this period purchased vast acreages for decidedly low prices. Brooking points to the irony of Mackenzie presenting himself as a victim of the clearances while effectively dispossessing the Maori from their land on a vast scale. Mackenzie followed the Scottish debates on the land question and attempted to learn from them. He was also disappointed that Scottish land reform in the late Victorian and Edwardian period appeared to learn nothing from New Zealand, particularly in the effective eradication of large-scale land ownership through the, the 999 year leases um, which his legislation introduced. It's also very striking that the Gallic societies in New Zealand of which Mackenzie was such a, an important figure seemed to be more politically active and interested in Highland land grievances than those of many other imperial locations. The Dunedin Gallic Society, for example, supported the campaigns of the Crofters, regretted the limited reforms of the 1880s. Money was sent from New Zealand to the Highland land movement um, and for the, the relief um, of, of distress. There was also active promotion, once again, of emigration schemes as a possible solution for congestion in particular Highland districts, uh, a solution, uh, of course, which was intensely controversial um, in, in the Scottish Highlands. I think as, as political historians, we've been uh, not nearly uh, outward looking enough um, in our analysis of, of Scottish politics. And I think the, the imperial dimension, the global dimension offers, again, rich possibilities for, for future research. So I want now to turn to, just in the, in the final few moments, to the end of that political culture of the 19th and early 20th century, which I've been talking about and try to finish by by coming, coming back up to date. And the end of, of liberal political culture of the 19th century can perhaps be dated to the election of, of 1922. And in the west of Scotland, such was the turnout at that election um, that there was insufficient transport to bring all the ballot boxes to the count. Carriages drawn by the black Belgian horses of funeral undertakers had to be pressed into service. The Glasgow Herald remarked that the superstitious might regard this as a bad omen. <laughs> you don't say. Um, this was a critic, uh, sorry, this was correct, and the requiem clearly was, was for the Liberal Party, which declined markedly throughout the interwar period. The Liberal Massacre of 1935, when the party which had dominated Scottish politics won only 7% of the vote and only three seats in Scotland which was a quarter of their best interwar share of the vote, which came in 1923. The 1935 election induced deep pessimism on the part of Sir Archibald Sinclair, the elegant and principled leader of the Samuelite uh, liberals. 
And it was that very factionalism which was, was such a big problem. Uh, Sinclair wrote to, to an Edinburgh colleague, not only have we lost our most trusted and influential leaders, but we could not make our free trade case. Nobody would listen to it or think about it. So the decline of that liberal culture in from 1922 up to the present day, the decline of a once uh, hegemonic party in Scotland is palpable, uh, really from the records of the party. Um, apologies to any, any liberals in the audience, but I can resist this, this anecdote. In December 1946, um, a 30-seater coach was hired to take liberal delegates from the east of Scotland to the meeting of the, the General Council of the party in Perth. Unfortunately, the booking had to be cancelled, as only eight seats were, were reserved. And of course, I wouldn't make the joke about there being more pandas on mainland Scotland than there are Liberal Democrats, uh, MSPs. That would be... That would be below the belt. <laughs> so the narrative then of, of 20th century Scottish politics uh, might be, uh, a narrative might be constructed which points towards devolution, enhanced devolution, or even, even independence. Creation, you know, if you wanted to stitch this narrative together, you could point to the creation of the post of Secretary, Secretary for Scotland um, in 1885. You could point to the development of administrative devolution in the period since then, um, the opening of uh, Scottish government offices here in Edinburgh, first of all at Drumshuk Gardens in 1936, and then St Andrew's House um, in 1939. You could look, for example, um, at the growth of nationalist or quasi-nationalist groups since the late 19th century, the Scottish Home Rule Association in 1886, the Young Scots in 1903, the National Party, the SNP, National Party in 1928, the Scottish National Party in 1934. You could look at the referendums in 1979 and 1997 pointing to a generational move uh, to support for, for Home Rule. You could look at the experience of the 1980s uh, Mrs. Thatcher as the matriarch of, of devolution. Sorry, Alan. Um, she certainly changed views, um, not least, of course, here in the, in the universities. Uh, Jerry Hassan recently uh, took me and, and other historians to task for laying much, too, much emphasis on Mrs. Thatcher's role in, in the, being the matriarch of, of devolution. But I think there are areas where her, her influence is, is very clear, even if the broad economic changes which she she oversaw might well have, have happened anyway in slightly different forms. But here in the universities, um, if you look at the, the comparison between the attitude of universities to devolution in the 1970s uh, compared to uh, those in the, in the 1990s, very, very negative about devolution in the 70s, much more positive um, in, the, in the 1990s. Um, indeed, in, in 1980, um, another of my predecessors, Geoffrey Barrow, uh, gave his inaugural uh, lecture, a lecture called The Extinction of Scotland, with a great degree of, of pessimism. And um, Geoffrey told me that it, this, this, this caused him much grief from his, from his fellow uh, professors because of his positive attitude towards devolution and, and, and nationalism. And Geoffrey, in that lecture, sort of challenged Scottish intellectuals to, uh, to take up the challenge of, of preventing the extinction of, of Scotland. And of course, in his own work, um, as much as in the work of, of the generation of Scottish historians who've, who've followed, Geoffrey did a huge amount to, to prevent uh, the, the occurrence of what he was worried about in, in, in 1979, 19, 1980. So I think we need to take care not to create new myths around, around Mrs., Mrs. Thatcher. It's very striking to me, however, that, that in all the comment in the national press around the time of, of Mrs. Thatcher's death, um, there was hardly any reference to the importance of, of North Sea oil in sustaining the, the finances of, of, her, of her governments, something which Chris Harvey and Terry Brotherston and other historians have, have talked about. So constructing this narrative, you could turn again the final part of a narrative to the rise of the SNP since devolution. Uh, the 2003 Scottish election notwithstanding, minority government in 2007, unexpected majority in 2011, um, majority which confounded 
um, historians such as myself. Uh, the matter of can't, of course, be, be left there. There are great problems uh, with, this, with this narrative, and not least the traditions of unionism with a capital U and with a lowercase u in modern Scottish political um, history. Um, the Labour Party, um, the heart of the Labour Party, I think, beats um, very strongly for, for, for unionism, as we've, as we've seen recently. Until quite recently, the, the cultures of, of unionism in all its senses was a, was a huge gap in Scottish political history. And although recent work by Colin Kidd and our own Alvin Jackson have begun to fill the gap, and their work will hopefully stimulate others to explore further the political cultures of different types of unionism, especially in the period from the end of the Second World War to the mid-1960s, which remains virtually uncharted territory in Scottish political history. If the language used in political debate and coverage and means of communication at their heart of what, are called the, the, what is called the new political history, um, we've been singularly remiss in not engaging with the evidence for long periods of, of 20th century Scottish political history. Newspapers, again, are a part of this. Journalism, as a very distinguished Scottish journalist, Harry Reid, has argued, Scotland in the middle of the 20th century was at heart was at the heart of an extraordinary newspaper industry. At its peak, the Scottish Daily Express, hardly read at all by, by historians, had a circulation of 650,000 in Scotland, with the daily record setting around, uh, selling around 450,000. Far less forgotten titles like the Glasgow Bulletin, and I'm sure there are other, other examples. We know virtually nothing about this political culture of mid 20th century Scotland. And the fact that these sources are not available online is a very lame excuse for our neglect um, of them. So I think um, without a more complete picture of Scottish political history in the 20th century and the place of different traditions, nationalism, unionist, and other traditions, in a, our terms of reference in the current debate are, are uncertain. Um, if notions such as semi-independence, um, articulated by my colleague Alex Murdoch in his wonderful book about early 18th century Scottish politics, or Scottish autonomy, articulated by another Edinburgh colleague, Lindsay Patterson, in his book of that name, if these conditions can be detected within Scotland's experience of the Union, then it's perhaps possible that independence, if it occurs, might not see the end of the Union um, in, every, in every aspect. Uh, cannier advocates of independence, uh, such as the First Minister, I think have an innate um, understanding of this point. And I think Scottish political historians have sought to blur the distinctions between unionism nationalism through slightly overused phrases such as unionist nationalism, um, argued for by our former colleague Graham, Graham Morton. I'm not criticizing Graham for, for raising that phrase, but for other people for using it in a rather uncritical way. But nevertheless, it's an example of the way in which historians have sought to blur uh, the polarities in the, in the debate. So the, uh, the polarized debate um, in which we are in the midst it lies and disguises, I think, significant blurring of the potential outcomes of that debate. The opponents of independence, of course, have an interest in this polarization. But whatever one's view of independence, we can, I think, do better in tone and substance in the debate than we are at the moment. An awareness of the richness of Scottish political traditions and Scottish political histories um, can help us uh, to get uh, to a better tone in that important debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh, and I think uh, we all enjoyed that. It was a, a model of an inaugural, uh, incredibly wide-ranging, very, very scholarly and well-informed, and at the same time very engaging. Um, I think we have 
a short time for some questions because then I think we can move out to the reception and let those <coughs> people standing at the back and cramped on the stairs uh, stretch their legs a bit. Um, but I'd offer up a, a, a brief time for some questions, uh, possibly even for those many who were name-checked who want to have a right of <laughs> reply, perhaps. Ewan, thank you for the wonderful lecture. You talked about the fact there was almost no comment around the time of Thatcher's funeral on the fundamental role of North Sea oil in making her um, Friedman-esque experiments viable. How have you found this fact reflected or not reflected in the work of contemporary English historians writing about British history around that period? That's a very good question, Jamie. Um, well, hardly at all. Um, I think you know many historians have pointed out that in the, the biographies of the, the leading political figures um, of this period, uh, the official biographies of Harold Wilson, um, Heath, Thatcher. I haven't read, I haven't yet sort of girded my loins to look at the, um, <laughs> the, the new biography of, of Thatcher by uh, the, the Daily Telegraph editor, Moore, um, which, is, which is just out. But certainly in, in earlier biographies, in her, own, in her own autobiography, for example, there's certainly very, very, little, very little comment. Because, of course, it, it, it contradicts one of the key myths of, of Thatcherism that, uh, you know, the sort of corner shop, good housekeeping analogy, if you, use, if you use all your capital to finance current expenditure, then it's, uh, you know, it's problematic. Um, so uh, hardly at all. Um, you know, to be fair to, you know, as a popular historian, journalist Andrew Moore in his, um, in his recent uh, uh, popular books about modern, modern British history, I suppose that you know unpopular books like like mine. <laughs> um, uh, Mar does 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 touch on it, and the, the, there is of course a specialised uh, literature, but it is really not it's really not a prominent. And neither, to be fair, is it, is it you know I'm not saying that Scottish historians really get off the hook here. Um, it's not a tremendously well worked theme in Scottish political history. The work of of Chris Harvey, um, you know, former SNP MSP. Uh, aside, you know, that's, that's probably the only book-length uh, discussion, although there is also a new official history of, of North Sea Oil by uh, the Aberdeen economist Kemp, um, which is, has been just published. So, so maybe it's, it's coming, I was going to say back to the surface, but there's a terrible pun there, isn't there? So. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Thank you for your lecture, Ian. Um, obviously, some of it did dwell on the fact that the referendum is coming up. Um, do you feel that in general terms, Scotland's academic community could be more engaged with the debate because obviously, um, you know, on, on both sides of the debate, the academic community have, I feel like, a depth of knowledge that doesn't always come to the fore uh, in the day-to-day -day political aspect of the debate. But to my mind, it seems that, you know, for perhaps understandable reasons, people who don't need to be involved in the debate are not really, you know, champing at the bit to, to, to get involved. But it would be helpful, perhaps, if we could, you know, have more, a wider range of kind of informed voices, different perspectives to bear. So do you think that the academic community could be more engaged and do you think it, it will be more engaged over the next uh, year to 18 months? I, I hope so, Kevin. I'd, um, I'll come on to some aspects of modern academic bureaucracy in, in a moment, which, which touch on this. But yeah, I think, I think the academic community, uh, you know, could be, could be more engaged. I think many academics are... Um, are very engaged. Um, you know, Tom is a very important uh, public uh, commentator um, in Scotland. The, the politics department in, in this university are running um, a, a, a blog. Uh, Glasgow University are running a, a seminar series at which Chris Harvey is, is speaking uh, at the very moment, I think, um, uh, on, uh, on the independence uh, debate. Um, and, and academics, I think, are you know, quite significantly engaged in, in journalism. So I think that the academics ought to be engaged, and I hope you know, that many of my colleagues will be engaged. Uh, many of them are. Uh, my colleague, uh, Alvin Jackson, even, even went as far as to, to take himself across the bridge to Kirkcaldy uh, to, to, to give a lecture uh, based on the, the, the subject of his, of his book. And I think Lindsay Patterson has, has done the, the same thing in the, in the same in the same series. 
Um, and of course, academics are being encouraged at the moment through, uh, you know, the structures of things which, you know, needn't necessarily be very publicly well known. The research excellence uh, framework couldn't get through. We couldn't get through a whole hour without, <laughs> without talking about it, could we? Uh, knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer, impact, um, all these things are, I think, encouraging uh, academics to, to move out into the, into the political or into the, the public uh, sphere, which I think is vital that we do because we are public servants. We're paid by, by the public purse. We're paid to, to educate, to research, and to, to engage in, in debate. I think, you know, as, as you very well know yourself, involved in the day-to-day you know, -day, um, aspects of politics, I think it's vital that, that academics don't simply become cheerleaders for one particular party or another. I think, you know, even from your, you know, dare I say it, partisan point of view, Kevin, I think, um, you know, an academic cheerleader is, is of less value and has less uh, effect um, than, than a, a critical friend, if you like, making, making, informed, making informed comments. So, so I think there is, a, there is the danger of a caricature of, of academics, you know, resting in their, in their ivory towers. And I, I think I would resist that caricature. I think academics have been quite, um, quite active and, and out there in the, in the debate. But I think, and I think there's a genuine appetite, appetite for it. So this is a good question, Kevin, yeah. Once again, thank you very much, Ewan, for a great lecture. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.